from Brazil. I work there as a psychologist, and I am also a biologist from Harvard, as you used to say in Brazil. That's why I entered in a graduate program in applied ecology in the University of Sao Paulo. And what I will present here, it's part of the research that I've been conducting since 2020 as a student of master's degree under the supervision of Dr. Katia Ferraz and Dr. Silvio Marchini. The title of my presentation is Perceptions of Residents and Conservationists About Human-Wildlife Conflicts in the Surroundings of a Protected Area. I study case in the Brazilian Atlantic Forest. This research originated by a conservation issue which is the population decrease of large mammals of the Serra do Mar Biodiversity Corridor, a hotspot of biodiversity in the south of Brazil in the Atlantic Forest biome. And the mammals are the wild-leaf peccary, the jaguar, and the tapir, which have been monitored by a conservation program in the region because they are endangered species in the biome. And all the influential factors for the animal's population decrease are related to anthropic pressure, like hunting, domestic dogs, collision with vehicles, and illegal extraction of palm heart. So one of the possible conservation strategies that was envisioned by the professionals who worked there was the mammal's population reinforced, reinforcement in one of the protected areas of Serra do Mar Corridor which is the Bom Jesus Biological Reserve. That is my study area. You can see better here in the map. This reserve was created in 2020, located in the state of Paraná, south of Brazil. It has around 34,000 hectares, and it belongs to the category of integral protection. In Brazil, the protected areas are named conservation units, and they can be of two types, a conservation unit of sustainable use or a conservation unit of integral protection, as it is this reserve. This type of conservation unit, as the name says, integral protection aims to protect nature. So it is not allowed visitation, nor the direct use of natural resources only for scientific and educational purpose. Due to these conditions, this was considered an interesting place to a conservation strategy for the endangered species from the ecological point of view. But when the conservationists were envisioning that strategy, they realized they also needed to consider another aspect, which is the people living in the surrounding of the reserve especially because what I said earlier about the anthropic pressure that the animals have been suffering from. So there were a few questions they considered very important to analyze before trying the mammals population reinforcement. For example, how will the local communities react to the presence of the animals? If there were more animals, would it be a situation of conflict? What kind of conflict? What are their feelings about the animals? Would they accept the presence of these animals? And as I told you before, once this ecological corridor is a hot spot of biodiversity, there is a huge presence of environmental institutions in the region, like NGOs, research institutions, government agencies. That's why we also consider necessary to examine the community's percep perceptions about these institutions. For example, are they favorable to the protection measures of environmental institutions? Will they engage with future conservation strategies? How do they feel about the presence of these institutions in the region? They like them, they don't like them, they support their work, and as the same way, we wanted to examine a few matters with the conservationists who work there. Like, what are their perceptions about the relationship between communities and wildlife and between communities and environmental institutions? Is the conservation strategy of a professional aligned to the community's needs? 
What are their perceptions over the efficacy of the mammals population reinforcement in the region? So my research stemmed from this point, the necessity to listen to all the people who are involved in the context before trying a conservation strategy. My objectives were to analyze the perceptions of two groups, the local communities living in the surroundings of the reserve and the conservationists who work there to examine what are the key factors in order to accept the endangered mammals of the region, and especially with the local communities, to identify their feelings, values, knowledge about wildlife and environmental institutions. Essentially, our main question is related to the principles of human-wildlife coexistence, which is, as Katja said before, a condition in which both parts involved, people and wildlife, might exist together in a sustainable way. So I went there. I used the methodology of semi-structured interviews, and I talked to 20 professionals of conservation area who had a big knowledge about the region, and I also interviewed 40 people from local communities. I had open and closed questions, so it was a quantitative and qualitative methodology. The results show that, in general, there is a favorable attitude towards the animals. The, communi the communities like them, since guarded a safe distance. It's the classic, not in my backyard. Both groups reported situations of conflicts involving the three species that we usually find in literature, like the damage caused by the species to crops and to livestock. About the jaguar and the white lip peccary, the fear of being attacked was also mentioned as a factor of conflict for some people. And there are also other issues related. For example, for some extractivist communities, there are cultural factors involved, like the habit of hunting that is transmitted through generations, exactly as Martin said in the morning. I, I learned to hunt with my father and he learned with his father. In Brazil, we have exactly the same thing. And there are also imaginary ideas that interfere, like the belief that the NGOs rescue jaguars and drop them in the region. That's not true, but lots of people spread this fake information. So in their opinion, these NGOs would be more concerned with the animals than with the communities, which makes some of them angry at wildlife. Concerning to the mammals population reinforcement, there are differences in the degree of acceptance among the species. Being the taper, more likely to be accepted, while the jaguar had the highest rejection index. And one interesting factor that appeared during the interviews was that sometimes the residents said, oh yes, the communities would accept the animals here, but they would hunt or they could hunt. So I added this information in the same graphic, but I described the yes answers. So, or it was a yes accept answer or a yes for hunting answer. And we can see here, uh, big difference from the first figure that is important to consider related to risk situations for the animals, especially for the taper and the white lead packer for bushmeat, which made us conclude, as Glickman and collaborators recently published in a paper, that acceptance is not necessarily a condition to coexistence. And there are also the conflicts among groups of people. We find in literature the idea that resistance to the environmental institutions might be signs of deeper social conflict. And that appeared in my results. Looking at these pyramids base, we find a very complicated situation of political abandonment and socioeconomic vulnerability in the communities. And there are also issues related to land ownership and occupation, which were pointed as an antique and delicate situation of the territory, which were enhanced 
after the arrival of the environmental institutions. Once some of them bought lands in the region to do their conservation work. That way, the residents could no longer enter in some areas to use natural resources as they were used to. These situations provoke feelings of anger, frustration, and resentment. Besides that, there are ideological conflicts related to different perspectives about the problems and the ways to solve them. For example, there are some anthropologists who work in the region who defend the local communities and fight against the conservationists, arguing they only think about wildlife and they don't consider the community's interests. That increase even more the tension among the stakeholders. It is a type of conflict related to identity issues, created a split between we, the communities, versus them, the environmental people, as they used to say. All of that collaborates to a negative attitude towards environmental institutions, and therefore result in low engagement to conservation strategies of the communities. Despite of that, the communities do recognize the importance of this, these institutions' work. They also attach a great value to the region where they live because of the biodiversity's richness and the benefits of living close to nature. It seems the problem was the way these institutions conduct their relationship with the communities, using the classic top-down process of decision-making instead of a bottom-up process. Considering all of that, I refer to the authors who talk about just conservation, arguing that we need a paradigm change in the conservation field. From that perspective, the objectives and values of conservation must be reviewed towards conceptions of justice to human and non-humans, aiming a redefinition of human nature relationship, the consumption patterns, and the production systems. And considering that we live in an era in which we can no longer separate nature from people, but promote the coexisting between them, involving people in the conservation strategies, because people are part of the solution. Based on that, we suggest some recommendations to deal with this case. First of all, solutions based on reconciliation. For that, the dialogue is very important. But not any dialogue. It's necessary an active listening, which means a real interest and a capacity to listen to the other person's or group's interests. For that, the help of a professional mediator can be very useful. Focus on the common interests and needs, and not in the disagreement points. For example, my results show that despite the conflicts between communities and wildlife, no one wants the animal's extinction. And as I said earlier, everybody wants to preserve the region. The inclusion of local knowledge in the conservation planning. Activities that foster the community's participation and can bring them income, like community-based tourism. And take into account the cultural differences to adapt language, ways to approach and interact, respecting these differences. That's why we need a transdisciplinary approach, as Katja and Martin said before. Uh, that way, we can actually promote a human wildlife coexistence based on the integration of different fields of knowledge, academic and non-academic, like the local communities, the government, researchers from natural, human, and social science, all the stakeholders. In conclude, we need to improve management practice that acknowledge the needs of nature and the needs of people. That way, we can actually create opportunities to turn conflict into coexistence. I'd like to thank the support of the University of Sao Paulo, especially the Wildlife Ecology Management and Conservation Lab, coordinated by my advisor, Dr. Katja Ferraz. Thank you, Martin, for inviting us for this meeting, and thank you all for the attention. <laughs>